Hello everyone and welcome to this lecture on demand. We are continuing our discussion of microeconomics. I am David Smerden. Before we kick on to demand, let's see how we got here. So we've been talking a bit about supply and how producers come up with their own supply curves and how we can build that into a market supply curve. Now, the nice thing about supply is that it's very easy to follow the logic. You don't really have to question things too much. It's very simple that if you're a producer, you'd want to maximize your profit. That's where you get your benefits from, money. That's what producers want to do. So to maximize their profit, we've seen that mathematically that's the same as producing up until the point when marginal benefit equals marginal cost. Now marginal benefit is simple. That's the price that you get for the next good that you sell. Marginal cost was a little bit trickier. That was coming to terms with how much it costs to produce the next good. And that can change a little bit uh, over time um, given how much you're producing. However, we can get some idea of the general things that affect our marginal cost curve, uh, including for example, um, the marginal product of labor, which we've seen is diminishing in the short run. So you bring more workers into your coffee store when you've only got one machine. Each new worker, after a while, is not bringing as much to your productivity as the one before and the one before that. So that's why we generally have an upward sloping marginal cost curve. Now, it doesn't make sense for us to produce one more good if it's gonna cost us more to produce it than the money we're going to get from selling it. So that's at the point when marginal benefit equals marginal cost. So we know that the individual producer produces up until that point and then stops. And that makes sense because that's when they'll be maximizing their profit. There is one more caveat to that, which is that there are certain circumstances when it's better to produce zero. And that's the case in the short run if you're not even covering your variable costs. So that's when the price is actually below the minimum of the average variable cost curve. Now in the long run, all costs are variable. So the average variable cost curve and the average total cost curve is the same. And that shutdown rule is pretty much the same as well. So basically, you don't wanna produce if your price is below that minimum of the average total cost curve in the long run. And we put those things together and we end up with the supply curve for an individual producer. So you could think about yourself starting a small business, starting, well, a cafe, I use that example a lot. This is generally sort of rules that you'll be putting in place, even if it's through trial and error over time to get your individual supply curve. Now, in markets where we produce fairly homogenous goods, so goods that are pretty much the same, such as uh, coffee or such as ice cream or blank white t-shirts or even things like milk. Uh, generally speaking, the marginal costs or the sort of inputs that go into production are pretty similar across the different suppliers. So for example, with ice cream, you've got the inputs which are your ice cream and your cone and the labor you pay people to serve it maybe the rent of an ice cream van or the rent of a premises. Those costs are roughly the same across different producers in the market, which makes sense because if one of the producers had much more expensive input costs than the others, that producer is not gonna stay in business. So it makes sense in these sort of fluid markets with homogenous goods that those sort of marginal cost curves are reasonably similar across suppliers. And what that means is that we, as researchers, as governments, as forecasters, as whatever, analysts of this sort of market, can sort of approximate the whole supply of the market by taking the average of one of these producers and their marginal cost curve, and then adding those up horizontally. So we take those individual cost curves, the average, say, representative consumer, work out how many of them are in the market, then add those up horizontally, put that all together, and that will give us our standard upward sloping supply curve. So it's reasonably straightforward to go from the micro level all the way up to the point where we get our supply curve, which is one half of the most famous graph uh, in economics, supply and demand. 
Now today, we're going to look at the demand side where things are a little bit less straightforward for the simple reason that producers like money and make their choices on the basis of money. Consumers want to be happy and happiness is a tough concept to get down mathematically, but we're going to try our best. So we've seen the supplier side with producers. Now we're going to look at the demand side with consumers. Now, if it's about happiness, you'd think we'd be bringing psychologists into this or sociologists. But what economists have done is come up with a concept called utility. And you can think of utility a bit like satisfaction, pleasure, preferences, tastes, things that make you happy. It doesn't really matter, but it's the benefit that a consumer gets from consuming some sort of good. Now, of course, the more we consume of stuff, the happier we get. So why don't we just consume forever? Well, of course, as we've learned in economics, economics is about scarcity, which means it's about choices and about trade-offs given our constraints. Consumers are constrained by their budgets, how much money they've got, and how much time they've got. And we've seen in the concept of opportunity cost that time and money are related to each other. The more time we have, the more time we can spend earning money, for example. The more money we have, more free time we can buy. So these things are exchangeable in some sense. So what we want to do is get to the demand curve of an individual. And to get to the demand curve of an individual, we'll see that they are not maximizing benefit in terms of profit, but maximizing benefit in terms of their happiness or in terms of utility. Now, just like we had a rule about decreasing marginal product of labor in the production process for producers and for suppliers. We've got a rule for consumers as well. And these assumptions seem to make sense and we'll need them in order to build up our model. So this assumption is about decreasing marginal utility. Now utility means happiness, marginal means one more, decreasing, we know what that means. So it's saying you get less and less happy each time you consume one more good than the one before that. So the first beer is pretty good, the second beer also pretty happy, not as happy as you were from getting that first beer, third one not quite as much content. Okay with beer the example gets a little bit skewed, the same goes for consuming pizza, consuming t-shirts, consuming anything. All right so that happiness from an extra unit is going down over time. So, just like we had a few little definitions for the supply side of the market, we've got the same ones for the demand side, more or less. Instead of quantity supply, on our x-axis we'll be having quantity demanded. We'll have the demand curve, which is this line, this relationship between price and quantity, in this case price and quantity demanded, and only those two things for a given line. That relationship between those two variables, which you can think like your x and y variables in, in normal graphs, are also represented in a demand schedule, which plots certain points that exist uh, on that graph. And you put that all together for each individual consumer and you end up with market demand. So let's see a simple example. We've got our standard downward sloping demand curve. Why is it downward sloping? Well, let's say we start at this point here where for a price of $700 per unit, uh, roughly 3 million tablets are demanded per month. We can see that also in the demand schedule as well as being represented by a point on the demand curve. Now, as the price falls, can see that the quantity of tablets demanded increases. In this case, the quantity has increased to 4 million. We can see that both on the points and on the demand schedule. And as we move down the demand curve, we can see the same relationship reflected in the demand schedule. So this is the definition of the quantity demanded. It represents that quantity that maximizes the utility experienced by the individual consuming it for a given price. So at the moment we haven't got into the black box of how people maximize their happiness. We just assume that people are doing that. So it's not like we make perfect decisions all the time, 
but across the board over time with our intuition with our experience we do seem to do what makes us happy and we assume that about consumers they do what makes them happy they consume a coffee if it makes them happy relative to how much that coffee is going to cost them they stop drinking coffee at the point where it no longer gives them happiness that outweighs the cost of that next cup of coffee so we assume that that process is already happening and has happened behind the scene and that tells us for a given price how much that individual will consume to maximize that happiness or that utility put those things together we get our demand curve now just as we could uh, tweak the different inputs as a supplier to see what our outputs are going to be to work out how to minimize our marginal cost to produce a certain quantity in the same way as a researcher or as an external analyst we can get an idea to estimate a demand curve by tweaking those prices so if you own a cafe and you want to get some idea of what the demand curve is for your goods you could change your prices three dollars seventy for a coffee on monday three dollars eighty for a coffee on tuesday three dollars sixty for a coffee on wednesday you could take all of that data put it together and work out how much is being bought at different prices which will give you a rough estimate of what this demand curve looks like and that's a pretty simple way to do things that actually most small businesses do do they they experiment to get some idea of how that quantity demanded is changing uh, for given prices another point to note about the demand curve is that if we draw a rectangle from a point on that demand curve to the origin that rectangle will represent the consumer expenditure at that point and that sort of makes sense because for example here we've got a price of three dollars per kilogram at that price the quantity demanded is six kilograms how much have people spent well they've spent six dollars per kilogram on three kilograms that's the rectangle six times three equals 18. Another point to note, as I mentioned before, is that the relationship between price and quantity are the only two things being considered along that line. Just in the same way that a line y equals x plus two shows the relationship only between x and y and how y changes when x changes, so all points on a demand curve represent how the quantity changes when the price changes and vice versa, but nothing else. And that's what ceteris paribus means. We hold everything else constant and we look at that relationship between the two goods. And with that assumption, we can formulate the law of demand. Now the law of demand formally says that holding everything else constant, when the price of a product falls, the quantity demanded will increase. And when the price of a product rises, then the quantity demanded will decrease. Or in simple layman's terms, it's the tendency that we see in the world around us that consumers seem to demand more of a certain good or service when the price of that good or service decreases. In other words, we have a downward sloping demand curve. And we seem to see that in the real world. So if we see it in the real world, we of course could just stop there and let it be. But in reality, we want to get a little bit more into the detail of what it means and why it is that it's downward sloping. Why exactly? So we're going to decompose that effect into three reasons. The substitution effect, the income effect, and the law of diminishing marginal utility, or this decreasing additional satisfaction. Now we've spoken a bit about this third one already. The fact that as you keep consuming stuff, it gets less and less uh, beneficial for you. Um, but the substitution effect and the income effect now these are a little bit trickier the substitution effect is the tendency that if the price of something goes up and becomes more expensive then other goods start looking relatively better even though maybe the price of those things haven't changed so for example the price of coca-cola goes up suddenly Pepsi is starting to look relatively cheaper, we might switch over to Pepsi. So we're substituting our previous Coca-Cola consumption with Pepsi consumption. That's the substitution effect. 
The income effect is really this idea of purchasing power, which you might have heard about before. So purchasing power is the income, uh, the, the effect of being richer or poorer on what you purchase and how much of that you purchase. So if you suddenly have your salary doubled or tripled, you're likely to buy more of most goods. Uh, if you suddenly lose a lot of money, you might have to cut back. Doesn't mean you cut back on everything, but certainly some goods like Coca-Cola, you might start cutting back on. Now, these two effects always combine themselves into the behavior that we see about people when prices go up or down. Whether or not they buy more or less is always this combination of the substitution effect and the income effect. However, we are interested in separating those out to try and work out how much of the reaction of people's behavior is due to substitution and income. And that's interesting because sometimes they both go in the same direction and we can add them on top of each other. Sometimes they go in different directions. And then the question is, which of the effects is bigger and dominates the other one? Okay. So this is just a repetition of what I've said before about the substitution and income effects. Let's get into a tiny bit of jargon, although you've probably already picked up a bit of this already. A substitute is one of these products that we might substitute for another one if the price of that one gets, gets too high, for example. Coca-Cola and Pepsi are two examples. A complement, on the other hand, is a product that we'd like to consume roughly the same amount or similar amounts to another product. So they complement each other, like toothpaste and toothbrushes, or hamburgers and uh, so hamburger buns and hamburger patties, that sort of stuff. Um, tomato sauce and sausages, for example. Now purchasing power, we've already spoken about a little bit. That is the value of the money you've got in terms of how much you can buy in units. So if the price of Coca-Cola goes up, then your purchasing power of Coca-Cola has gone down unless you've magically earned more money in the process. Now let's get very formal about substitutes and complements. Two goods are substitutes for each other when if the price increases of one, the quantity demanded of the other also increases. So think again, Coca-Cola and Pepsi, sugary drinks that I hope you don't drink too much of, but are good examples. If the price of Coke goes up, you will demand more Pepsi. You're likely to substitute away from Coke, maybe get a bit more Pepsi, it's relatively cheaper. So they're substitutes for each other. Complements are such that when the price of one goes down, the quantity demanded of the other goes up and vice versa. So for example, hamburger buns become cheaper. Sounds good, let's make more hamburgers. So you're going to buy more hamburger patties, that's hamburger meat. All right, so now let's, let's take these two abstract notions, substitution effect and income effect, and look at them separately. Now remember, we don't see these things in isolation. We always see their combination, but it's good to think about them in isolation. They're two different effects happening on the same thing. Okay, so substitution effect is capturing this willingness to move to other goods or not, depending on changes in price. So for example, if the price of Coca-Cola goes down, we're going to consume more of it and less of some other drinks. If the price of Coca-Cola goes up, we're going to maybe switch to Pepsi or something else, so we'll consume less Coca-Cola. Relatively straightforward, doesn't depend on the type of good. The substitution effect always acts in the same sort of way. What about the income effects? Well, here things get a little bit less clear. So, this is the change in the quantity demanded because of us getting richer or poorer in terms of our purchasing power, okay? So let's say the price of Coca-Cola goes down. What does that mean? Well, it means that overall we're a little bit richer. So what does that mean in terms of how much Coca-Cola we consume if we're a little bit richer? 
well, you might think, well, I'll consume more. And you're probably right. But that's not always the case for all goods. And the reason for that is because some goods are different to others. We usually categorize them into two, normal goods and inferior goods. Now, normal goods are such that when your income goes up, you consume more of it. And you might think Coca-Cola is a pretty good example for that. Maybe it's true. But for inferior goods, your demand actually decreases when your income goes up. So uh, some examples of that are home brand sort of items, lower quality sort of items, maybe the Coles version of certain goods when you go to the store, um, or, or low, low quality meats, for example, the lower star minces, that sort of stuff. When you get a bit more money, you're going to move into a new class, so to speak, and so you stop buying those sort of goods or at least you buy less of those sort of goods. So that's the effect of income. Now, what happens, uh, okay, so it's just to be formal about that again, for a normal good, when your income goes down, you consume less of that good, when your income goes up, you consume more of it. For an inferior good, it's exactly the opposite. Now this is talking about a change in income. So, uh, but what we're interested in here is the combined substitution and income effects from a change in price. Now we've got these two effects uh, operating simultaneously, sometimes in the same direction, but sometimes not. So let's say the price of coffee goes down. Two things are going to happen. Maybe you're going to drink more coffee and less of something else. Maybe you were drinking tea, maybe you were drinking Coke, and now you're gonna have more coffee. So there's a substitution effect that's making you buy more coffee. On the other hand, because the price of coffee's gone down, you're also a little bit richer. And what are you going to do with that extra money? Well, you're going to buy more of normal goods. Coffee's a normal good. So you're gonna buy more coffee for that reason too. So even though we see people buying more coffee, there are two separate effects working at the same time. But now let's take it up a notch. So imagine that you're mainly living on canned tuna, don't have much money for food, we'll call that an inferior good, and suddenly tuna becomes really, really cheap. Really cheap, like let's say 10% of what it normally was. Okay, well, all this other food that I was buying, maybe instead of buying hamburgers or whatever else, I'm gonna buy more tuna and eat more tuna because that's the substitution effect, it's relatively cheaper. But on the other hand, I've been waiting for my chance to sort of break out of this tuna-filled student life and get into real food, and now I'm suddenly kinda richer. I was spending a lot of my income on tuna, and now I'm saving a lot of extra money, so I'm gonna spend it on better food. But if I'm gonna buy better food, it means I'm having less tuna. So we've got these two different effects and they're working against each other. And then the question is, which one wins? Do we end up buying more tuna or less? Well, usually the substitution effect dominates. So typically what that means is, for example, in the case of tuna, when tuna becomes very cheap, I'm gonna buy more tuna because of the substitution effect less tuna because of the income effect, but when I put them together, my overall result will be more. So I'll buy more tuna overall. Maybe if it was a 90% discount on something a bit, a bit higher quality, like a normal good, um, like rump steak, then I would buy even more rump steak. But in this case, still overall, I'm going to buy more. But there are some cases, very rare cases, where the income effect for an inferior good dominates this substitution effect, which means, and this is the strange thing, when the price of a good increases, the overall quantity consumed increases. And that obviously violates the law of demand. Now, these are rare cases, but I find them kind of interesting, so we'll quickly discuss uh, what happens there. You can actually Google this stuff and you can find some strange historical examples of this. Um, the Irish potato famine is probably the best known about these, but they've also been, um, I think there was a, a study done about uh, rice uh, famine in, in Hong Kong as well. Um, 
The situation we need for this to happen is that a good needs to be very inferior without close substitutes. So there can't be other foods available that are very easy to substitute for the one where there's been this increase in price. Um, and that means the substitution effect can't be too big. It also must be the case that this good previously made up a large amount of people's incomes. In that case, we want the income effect to really be very big. In that case, the income effect can dominate the substitution effect. An example of this is just prior to the French Revolution, and actually one of the factors uh, that, that historians say sparked the French Revolution. And that was when a lot of French families, like impoverished French families in rural areas, were spending 75% uh, of their weekly income on bread, just bread. There was really not that much other food available, there weren't close substitutes, and they were spending such a big portion that when the price of bread um, went up, for example, they got, they felt much poorer, and so they needed to keep eating, and they would substitute away from whatever meat or fruit or other stuff they were spending money on to the cheapest thing available, which was bread, even though the price of bread had gone up. Okay, so back to the demand curve of an individual then. For both normal and inferior goods, because the substitution effect is dominating the income effect for inferior goods, we'll see the law of demand holding, which is this downward sloping demand curve. And we can interpret this demand curve in two ways, the same way that we could interpret the supply curve in two ways. So horizontally, that means we start at a certain price and we see what's the quantity that people are willing to buy at that price. Now, as the price lowers, we would imagine that people would be prepared to consume more, so the quantity goes up. Or vertically, and vertically means we take a given quantity and we say that if a person is to consume this quantity, what's the maximum that they're willing to pay to consume that quantity? What's the maximum they're willing to pay? And that will match exactly to the point on the demand curve because we've assumed that individuals are maximizing their utility uh, at that point. And that's also called the consumer reservation price or this willingness to pay. Okay, so what we can do is we can do that for each unit. We can say for one unit, what's the maximum I'm willing to pay? That might be $2 for, for a can of Coke. If I buy a second can of Coke, how much am I willing to pay for that unit? It might be less now, so in this case, it's four thirds or, or $1.33. Then the third can of Coke, well, I didn't really want the third can of Coke, but maybe for a dollar, I would buy it and so forth. And we can build up this demand curve in this step-like fashion. But once we start either putting people into one big market so that we've got many, many people, or we think about products that are more easily divisible, we start talking about um, grams of a certain product, uh, or we talk about the millions of cans of Coke, then this sort of step function smooths out and we get a continuous model where we have a downward sloping demand curve. And we'll typically focus on straight lines uh, for this course, so downward sloping lines. Now, this line represents the marginal benefit curve for each consumer, what their benefit is, and hence their maximum willingness to pay for each different unit. So any change in price then is represented by the change in this marginal benefit at the new quantity, so a change in quantity, and that's a movement along the demand curve. However, we're also very interested in things that shift the curve, that draw new curves for us, uh, just as we were very interested in this for supply. We don't want to confuse movement along the demand curve with a shift in demand, the same uh, issue that we had with supply as well. So again, movement along the demand curve or just a change in demand represents anything where just the price has changed, the effect on quantity when just the price has changed. On the other hand, uh, so that's everything we've seen before, these points on the demand schedule, for example. But on the other hand, a shift in demand is where we actually draw a new curve, a new line, or we can talk about moving it out and to the right, or in and to the left. So that's anything besides price that can change consumer demand. And we talk about an increase in demand, or a decrease in demand, or a shift of the demand curve to the left, to the right. So 
an increase in demand then, that's movement to the right. And for example, this says that at a price of $2 before, I was willing to uh, buy eight kilograms. Now I'm willing to buy 16 kilograms. And obviously a decrease in demand is the opposite. That line moves in and for each given price, I'm now prepared to consume less of that item. So the question is, what shifts demand? And this is a very important question in business strategy and also in marketing. Now, we're going to keep things reasonably broad. We won't go too much into the nitty gritty, but there are five main categories that shift demand. The first is a change in consumer tastes or preferences. Now here note that we don't actually talk about why these consumer tastes or preferences shift. We just take that as given. And indeed, even though there, there is a large body of literature in psychology and marketing about the different psychological factors that can affect changes in tastes and preferences, sometimes they just happen and there's no explanation for it. They've just happened. People just decide, for example, they now really wanna buy toilet paper, they buy toilet paper, so be it. They've changed their preferences uh, and we have to take that as given and we shift the demand curve. In other occasions, including toilet paper, we can try to put some rationale behind it in terms of the other four categories. Okay, the second uh, category is about a change in the number of consumers which sort of corresponds nicely to the category that shifts supply, which is a change in the number of producers. The third is the change in the price of a related market, so related goods, and those can be complements, those can be substitutes, depending on the type of relationship that will shift the graph in different ways. The fourth is a change in not prices, but expectations about future prices. And you don't even have to be right. You don't even as a consumer um, have to know perfectly how prices are going to change. You just need to have this belief about how they'll change and that will affect your behavior today. And the final thing is about income effects. That is, all consumers get more money or get less money and that can affect demand in different ways as we've seen. Now, notice that for each of these categories and shifts, we're again talking about a change to just one category that makes our lives a lot easier when building up this model. And notice that in all of these categories, the price of the good at this time cannot be a factor in shifting the curve. So here are some examples. A successful marketing campaign will change consumer tastes and preferences. Population growth will change the number of consumers. The price of a substitute changes, that's gonna affect demand for our good. You may expect prices to go up in the future and that's going to affect what you do today. We find this very often in the housing market or in recent times to do with this panic selling or different runs on, on markets in the supermarket. And if the government lowers taxes for everyone, that's an increase in purchasing power for all of our consumers. So what we're going to do now is we're going to do a few examples and I really encourage you to pause the video when I say pause see if you can come up with your answer about how you think the demand curve will shift, if at all, and then I'll tell you uh, what I think is going to happen. So example number one, explain what happens to the demand for gym membership when gym owners deliberately advertise that sex appeal that comes with having a great body. Pause your video now. Well, this is an example of marketing. It's an example of trying to positively shift consumers' tastes and preferences. By doing so, if they're successful, we would assume the demand curve to shift to the right. That is an increase in demand. Next one. Explain what happens to the demand for groceries in a small country supermarket when a sudden influx of city tourists arrives unexpectedly. Pause your video now. Well, this is an example of an increase in the number of consumers. We actually saw very recent examples of this in rural Victoria in particular where many uh, shoppers from Melbourne commuted out to small regional supermarkets to try to buy these essential items that had been depleted in inner city Melbourne stores. And that actually led to these small towns setting up um, security outside of their small supermarkets, their small IGAs. You needed to show that you were a local resident in order to shop there. 
So this increase in the number of consumers is going to shift demand to the right. The third example, the price of oil surges on overseas oil markets explain the effects on demand for petrol in Australia. Pause your video now. Well, this is an example about future prices and that expectation of future prices. If the price of oil goes up overseas, we can assume that in the future, the price of petrol in Australia is going to go up. If petrol is going to be more expensive in one week or two weeks or a month's time, people are going to want to buy now. So that means there's going to be a shift now to the right in terms of demand. Explain what happens to the demand for Coke when the price of Pepsi goes up. Pause your video now. Well, these items are substitutes. If the price of Pepsi goes up, then Coke has become relatively cheaper and you're going to demand more of it. So this is also going to shift demand to the right. Explain what happens to the demand for paper when computer ink price rises. Pause your video now. Well, this is just the flip side. These are complementary items or complements. So when the price of computer ink rises, people are going to be doing less printing. And if they're doing less printing, they'll need less paper. So this is going to shift demand to the left. Explain what happens to the demand for prawns when a consumer's income rises. And what's your assumption? Pause your video now. Well, if a, if a consumer's income rises, they're going to want to buy more of normal goods, not inferior goods. Now, most goods are normal. I would say that prawns in particular are normal goods in Australia, sort of sought after. If your consumer's income rises, we'd assume that they would demand more prawns. Explain what happens to the demand for two minute noodles when a consumer's income rises. Pause your video now. Well, this is a bit of a stereotype I've got, I guess, but the data seems to back it up as well. And that is, as people get richer, they consume less of two minute noodles. So in that case, we would expect a shift of demand to the left. That's because two minute noodles are considered here to be an inferior good. Explain what happens to the demand for toilet paper when consumers expect the supply to dramatically decrease in the future. Pause your video now. Well, the assumption here is that we expect prices to go up. It's not the change in supply necessarily that affects demand. It's how that expectation factors into things. Even if supply doesn't change at all or wasn't affected at all, which to a large extent is true in terms of COVID-19's toilet paper debacle, that expectation that consumers have is enough if they think that prices are going to go up a lot, there's going to be a dramatic increase in demand today. So that's a big shift to the right. There is also a game theory explanation for this, which we will discuss in later weeks. Okay, having got that out of the way, we're now going to move on to price elasticity. This is kind of a heavy topic, which sort of um, doesn't have, uh, yeah, this is a, a natural break in the lecture, which is where I would typically play a bit of music for you. And, but this might be a nice time to get a cup of coffee or a tea or a Coke if you're so inclined and then come back for price elasticity. Right. So now that we've covered both supply and demand, we've worked out why we've got these two graphs in our X, the famous um, economics graph about supply and demand, but it doesn't say so much about perhaps what the slope of these lines are, what the, uh, the shape of the, them are. This comes into price elasticity, which does more than just suggest um, does quantity go up or down with the change of price. It also answers the question, by how much, how sensitive and how responsive are these graphs to changes in price. There's another reason why we care about elasticity and that is for suppliers, they may well want to answer the question, how high can I raise my price without losing too many customers and impacting my profits? And elasticity can help us to answer this, particularly with regard to revenue maximization. 
Now elasticity is a term used to measure the sensitivity of some variable to a change in another. And what we'll be looking at for this course is the change in quantity given a change in some price. Now why do we have the term elastic? Well, if something is not elastic or inelastic, you can't really stretch it. It's not very sensitive, it's not very responsive when a force is applied, like a brick. In our case, that responsiveness is about quantity and the force is price, changes in price. If something is elastic, like a rubber band, then it's flexible enough to change its state when some force is applied. When we report elasticity, by the way, we're typically going to use the absolute value. In definitional terms, it's the percentage change in quantity divided by the percentage change in price. It's just this ratio and we're very much interested in whether the number, the absolute value, is less than one, equal to one, or larger than one. That's the information that we want. The specific definition, the formal definition, is about the percentage change in quantity demanded from a very small change, percentage change in price. That's the price elasticity of demand. There are others, but we'll focus on that for the time being. And one way to see it is by three mathematical formulas that are all equivalent. Now this may seem a little bit uh, uh, overwhelming at first, but these three formulas are all mathematically the same. And that bottom one there is just the definition that we had on the previous slide. It says the percentage change in quantity given a percentage change in price at a given point. These other two um, formulae here are the same, but are just different ways to calculate it, which may or may not be easier depending on the context. For example, um, if we've got a slope, then we may want to use the slope formula. Now, when we report the elasticity, we'll typically use its absolute value, even though for the elasticity of demand, it will always be negative. Now, why will it always be negative? Well, we're measuring the responsiveness of quantity to changes in price. But when the price increases by a little bit, will demand less. So that responsiveness must always be negative. So we don't really care about that minus sign. We care about how much it's changing in absolute terms. Now, elasticity is not the slope, even though it features in one of the three formulae for elasticity. We can see that it's not the slope, which is a common mistake, from a simple example. So let's take these two different points on the same line. Now, because it's the same straight line, we've got the same slope, but we'll see that the elasticities are very different. So looking at the top left here, a percentage change in quantity demanded divided by a percentage change in quantity price. Let's focus on the numerator here. So the percentage change in quantity demanded, if we go from 10 to nine, is that difference, which is one, divided by where we started, which is 10. That's how we work out a percentage formula. So that's essentially a decrease by 10%. Makes sense, you know, you, you were buying 10, now you're buying nine, you're buying 10% less. And what about the price change? Well, the price has gone from $2 to $2.02. It's gone up by two cents, which is an increase of 1%. So the quantity has gone down by 10%. The price has gone up by 1%. Now forget about the down and up part. Just think about 10 on the top, one on the bottom, it's gonna be 10. So the elasticity is 10, minus 10 technically, but 10, it's a big number. Now let's look at the bottom right. Here, we've gone from 100 chips to 99 chips. That's a decrease of 1%. The price has gone from 20 cents to 22 cents. That's an increase of 10%. So we've got a one on the top, a 10 on the bottom. So the elasticity of demand here is 0.1. We can see as we move down and along the demand curve, 
that the price elasticity of demand is getting smaller and smaller, closer to zero, or more inelastic. It's getting more inelastic. So it is related to slope in the sense that before we looked at two different points, but if we take one point and we just flip the slope of the demand curve, we rotate it around 90 degrees, we can see how that price elasticity of demand is going to change. A perfectly flat demand curve would be perfectly elastic. A perfectly vertical demand curve would be perfectly inelastic. And that you can sort of get the idea if you look at that vertical line. Remember, elasticity is talking about how flexible or sensitive or responsive consumers are to changes in price, how much they're able to change their behavior. If they're perfectly inelastic, their quantity demanded is absolutely fixed and they can't change it no matter what. Take someone who's taking life saving medication, for example, to keep them, you know keep them alive, they've got to take a pill every single day. Changes in price are not going to change their quantity demanded in that case. Now typically speaking, that's perfectly elastic and perfectly inelastic demand doesn't exist, but it gives us some sort of idea of the boundaries of where products uh, can lie. Okay, so let's do an example of how to calculate um, elasticity. When the price of baby formula tins increased from $20 to $22, the quantity of formula demanded decreased from 100 dollars to 80 uh, sorry, from 100 tins to 87 tins. So what is the price elasticity of demand for baby formula? Let's use our standard percentage definition, elasticity of demand. The price has increased from $20 to $22. That's a 10% increase. So we're going to put 10% on the bottom. Quantity has fallen from 100 tins to 87 tins. That's a 13% decrease. So we're going to put 13 on the top. Overall then the elasticity is 1.3. Minus 1.3, but we're not so interested in the minus. That means that the demand for formula is elastic. It's elastic because it's greater than one in absolute terms. So we're going to call anything greater than one elastic demand. If it's less than one, between zero and one, just a decimal with a minus in front, doesn't matter, that's inelastic demand. And then that sweet spot of one, that's unit elastic demand. Now, we really only care about whether it's above one or less than one, and the reason is to do with revenue. So if it's less than one, we've got inelastic demand, then an increase of price will increase revenue. If it's greater than one, consumers are quite responsive, they're quite flexible, then if we increase price, we're actually going to decrease our revenue. The best way to see this is through an example. So let's imagine that for the Broncos season, back when they could have spectators, a can of Coke was $2 and they sold 8,000 cans. We want to calculate the elasticity of demand. We're going to assume that demand for Coke is linear. Perhaps this has been worked out by marketers before or economic students doing some research. So this is the quantity demanded. In this case, it's actually going to be convenient for us to use the slope formula. Now, how do we get the slope formula? You might remember how to calculate the equation for graphs from high school. It's reasonably straightforward here in that we just have to actually take the ratio of the intercepts. We take the ratio of the y-intercept to the x-intercept and we get 6 over 12 or a half. It's actually minus a half, but we'll forget about that. So the slope's quite simple here. 6 divided by 12, that's a half. The rest of that formula said that at the point we're interested in, we do P divided by Q. So at the point here, the price is two, the quantity is eight. We're going to put things in thousands of cans. Put that all together, we get an elasticity of 0.5, which is inelastic. Now you might be wondering, well, hang on, we kind of cheated a bit because this 12 here should be 12,000 cans demanded. But actually, if we make that 12,000, 
then um, we also need to change this 8 to 8,000. And this 12,000 actually is going to sit up the top here on the denominator. So essentially, if we change things into thousands, we'd be multiplying the top by a thousand and the bottom by a thousand nothing would change for our elasticity calculations. So we'll just keep it nice and simple. So we get 0.5. Okay, so now let's imagine that the manager knows something about elasticity, he knows it's inelastic, he thinks, great, I'm gonna increase the price to $3. Now when he does so, 6,000 cans are sold. So what's the elasticity of demand now at this new point on the demand curve? Well, let's use the same formula, but replace the price and quantity by the new price and quantity. Price of three and 6,000 is the quantity, or six in our formula. When we do this, we see that we get exactly one. So we're now at the unit elastic point. Third example then, things are going all right. The manager decides to increase the price now to $4 and 4,000 cans of Coke are sold. What's the elasticity of demand now? Same formula again, but this time we see that it's 4 over 4 on the left. It's still 1 over a half on the right, so we end up with 2 as our answer. Demand is elastic at this point. As we saw before, uh, demand's getting more and more elastic as the price goes up. So what are the implications for revenue? Well, as I said before, when things are inelastic, you can increase your price and your revenue goes up. When it's elastic, you'll have the opposite effect if you increase your price. And we can see that by again looking at these rectangles. Remember these rectangles from the origin, they represent the consumer expenditure at those points because it's the price times the quantity. Now at that sweet spot, where it's unit elastic, price is three, quantity is 6,000, revenue is 18,000. Now, if we look at either side of things, so for example, when the price is four and the quantity is 4,000, in that case, demand uh, is price elastic and our revenue is only 16,000. So when the manager increased the price, when things were unit elastic, it actually decreased the revenue. What about on the other side of things, where the demand is price inelastic? Again, that revenue is 16,000. So it's less than that maximizing revenue point at the sweet spot. So how does this work in the real world? Well, let's get some idea of the price elasticity for common products that we'll find. Now, steel is an input used in so many industries that really rely on steel as part of its supply chain which means that as the price of steel fluctuates, a lot of these um, producers who rely on this as an input have to keep purchasing steel, which means they don't have much flexibility or elasticity or responsiveness to these changes. That's why the price elasticity of demand is so low for steel. Take restaurant meals as a completely sort of counter example. For you and I, if suddenly if we were eating out once or twice a week and then suddenly our restaurants double their prices, not interested anymore, we'll substitute to something else, stay at home and cook, duck over to mums, whatever. So that is a relatively elastic market in terms of the price elasticity of demand. Um, same goes for air travel, international air travel, particularly people who are um, going on holidays or can sort of decide whether or not they want to go now or later. They'll wait a fair bit, put it off, change to doing a domestic holiday if the price goes up too much. Now that's going to be quite a fair bit different if we restrict things to looking just at business class travel, of course. You've got things now like tobacco, coffee, cannabis, and also soft drinks with a lot of sugar. All of these things are addictive to some extent. Which, makes, uh, which explains to us why these have relatively inelastic price elasticity of demand. Things like theater, opera, and golf, we're looking at these high income individuals who essentially don't care about spending their money. Price goes up, 
doesn't phase them too much. And then Coke is an interesting one because it highlights a key point, which is that an individual product usually has more elastic demand than its overall category of goods. So while people are willing to give up Coke, drink less Coke, switch to Pepsi, switch to beer, switch to juice, switch to whatever, if the price of Coke goes up, they might not be willing to switch away from soft drinks in general. So someone who's switching to beer, to Fanta, to lemonade, to whatever, they might be addicted to those sugary drinks, which means that they're not willing to switch away from soft drinks overall. So we find the elasticity to be more elastic for a single good than for the whole category of goods. So what determines the elasticity of a good? Well, there are a couple of things. The availability of close substitutes. And again, here we look at these individual goods versus the category of goods. For example, uh, a lot of people really have got to have breakfast cereal. They've got to have cereal for breakfast. I've been doing it my whole life. If cornflakes suddenly get really expensive, I'm willing to switch. I'll have some Nutrigrain, some Sultana brand, some whatever's going. That's fine. I still want my cereal. There's not much of a substitute for me for cereal. By the way, this is not true for me. I don't have cereal, but whatever. Versus cornflakes. There are a lot of substitutes for cornflakes. The second is about the time horizon, short-term versus long-term effects. Take petrol, for example. If you own a car, the price of petrol goes up you're still going to have to buy petrol. But what if you know the petrol price is going to stay super high for the next five years? Then you start seriously thinking about selling the car, getting a bike, getting an electric car, getting a scooter, moving closer to your place of work, whatever. Essentials versus luxuries. Essentials, again, as the name suggests, they're essential versus luxuries which you buy when you've got the money, when they're relatively cheap. And finally, the share of a consumer's budget spent on a product or how much you care about things. So for example, if the price of, um, uh, I don't know, if the price of something I spend a lot of money on, like my rent uh, doubles, that's really going to affect how much I want to keep staying in the place that I'm staying in. If the price of dental floss doubles, that may not affect me so much because it's a relatively small expense in the larger scheme of things. Okay, so that's the price elasticity of demand. There are other elasticities that are interesting to us. The cross price elasticity is particularly interesting and that lets you know how closely competitive one product is to another. Um, so we're again looking at the percentage change in quantity demanded of the good on the top but on the bottom now, we're interested in the change in price of some other good. We want to know how responsive consumers are when the price of some other good changes. And some of the really interesting real world examples coming out of the US help to illustrate this point. So for example, if the price of imported tuna, sorry, what's meant to happen? If the price of imported tuna goes up, people buy more US domestic tuna by a fair bit. And that sort of makes sense because they're substitutes for each other. And it's a very competitive market. When people go to the shelves, they see both right next to each other. If the price of bread goes up, then you're not having as many tuna sandwiches as you used to. So people are going to buy less tuna. And that's why we see this negative, negative 0.33, the cross price elasticity. We can also see some interesting, interesting things here in terms of the magnitudes of substitutes. For example, beer and wine are clearly going to be substitutes, as in the price of wine goes up, some people are going to drink more beer. But more interesting is that this cross price elasticity is actually a little bit stronger when we consider uh, soft drinks and beer. They're a little bit closer together. Okay. We can also think about elasticity in terms of supply. So the price elasticity of supply is exactly the same formula, but here we're looking at the percentage change in the quantity supplied, resulting from a very small percentage change in price. And it's also measuring this responsiveness or this sensitivity. 
The formulas are exactly the same, but notice here that because we've got an upward sloping supply curve, the elasticity is always going to be greater than zero. And that's because when we increase the price, we're always going to be increasing the quantity supplied. Now, how much we're going to increase it, that's the elasticity part, but it's always going to be a positive number. We've got the same definitions as before in terms of elastic supply. That's when that elasticity number is greater than one. Inelastic supply is less than one. And the sweet spot again is unit elastic supply when it's equal to one. And again, even though it's not the slope, there's a relationship with the slope. If we fix a point, if we've got a perfectly vertical line, we've got perfectly inelastic supply. And that line is actually important because we do see it sometimes in the real world. There are occasions when there's simply not enough supply anymore. We've got a perfectly fixed supply for a market. Say, for example, for a precious mineral or resource, there's simply none that has no more that's been found or something that's uh, running out or extinct, um, something like uh, ivory, for example. Okay, so what changes the elasticity of supply? Well, there's the availability of raw materials. There's the mobility of your factors of production. There's inventories or excess capacity. Now this part, um, inventories and excess capacity is particularly relevant during this panic buying where there's actually been plenty of long run supply, but in the short run, there hasn't been those sort of inventories. And that also relates to the time horizon. So some of the supply of certain goods in the supermarkets has been very, um, very inelastic, unable to respond to changes in, in demand, for example, in the short term. But hopefully that sorts out in the long term. Okay, let's look at an example now of how elasticity is applied in the real world. You must all be familiar with Uber. It's worth many billions of dollars and they use a particular model of pricing called surge pricing where their price uh, automatically and dynamically changes with demand. And they've been criticized fairly heavily for this because during peak times or peak dates, the price of Uber can go up quite a lot. And this is actually responding to the inelasticity of demand and trying to maximize that revenue. Now, the argument that they've given to Congress and to government authorities is that this encourages more drivers to take to the road, which helps to expand supply, which is true to some extent, but there's also an argument of price gouging because there have been occasions where there've been many multiples of the normal rate being charged to consumers and consumers can feel like they've been taken advantage of. Um, for example, on uh, a New Year's Eve trip that would usually cost uh, around 50 or $60 was in uh, costing several hundreds at this particular screenshot that I found online. The worst example I found was a case where it was 50 times the normal rate. Now, economically, this makes perfect sense. But of course, as we've seen with COVID-19 as well, there are good reasons why price gouging should be illegal, which are not captured by our economic model, but has to do with other factors to do with um, equity and fairness. Now, not all firm, it's not only firms that can exploit consumer inelasticity, there are also governments. Now, in a few weeks, we'll talk more about how governments can earn, uh, can maximize their tax revenue. And one way to do that is by taxing highly inelastic demand. Now, there are certain products with highly inelastic demand that are also politically more palatable to tax, such as things that are addictive, such as alcohol, and tobacco. Now sugar would also be an example of something that's addictive but is less politically palatable. But one slightly quirky example has to do with the product you probably haven't thought about uh, very recently. In 2000 the Australian government introduced the GST, a goods and services tax of 10% on most goods. Now there were a few exemptions put in place such as medical, educational or religious uh, services and other necessities, and this was argued to be because of social or ethical reasons, uh, reasons, not economic. But there were certain decisions that were made about exemptions that seemed to make more economic sense. 
than social sense. And one strange example of this is tampons. So it was actually only in 2018, 18 years later, that under serious lobbying, the government finally scrapped the tampon tax. And that is it gave an exemption to tampons, which were until that point considered a luxury item. Now this is made all the more strange because razor blades have been GST exempt as a necessary item. And condoms have been GST exempt as a preventing illness item. Now this doesn't seem to make much sense from a social or ethical point of view, but economically we can see big differences about these three goods, particularly in terms of elasticity, in terms of the availability of other substitutes and so forth. The demand for tampons is particularly inelastic, which means that governments can maximize their tax revenue by taxing those items rather than say condoms or razor blades. Final bonus example has to do with another elasticity, which we won't talk about much in this course, but is a little bit interesting, and that is income elasticity. Again, we've got the quantity demanded on the top, but instead of price on the bottom, we've got income changes. So for example, imagine that you suddenly get robbed and you lose $1,000 out of your bank account. What do you buy less of this month? How do you make those choices? What do you buy the same of? What do you buy more of? And that has to do with uh, how you view the income elasticity of these goods. And a quirky example of this happened uh, in the uh, global financial crisis when a survey was uh, undertaken that looked at um, multi-millionaires who had extramarital lovers and found that more than 80% planned to cut back on the gifts and allowances that they gave to those lovers. So this is the effect of uh, income on the quantity demanded uh, of those services, I guess. Okay, so that's a brief summary of elasticity that we've looked at. The main things to take away is that if demand is inelastic, an increase in price leads to an increase in revenue. If demand is elastic, then an increase in price decreases revenue. Unit elastic is that sweet spot where we maximize revenue. Elasticity is not constant along the demand curve, even though the slope is. And as the price rises, demand becomes relatively more elastic. So that's it. That's all for today. And uh, thanks for listening in and we'll see you next time.